Okay, so welcome to this webinar. Um, this webinar is part of the Future of Evidence Synthesis webinar series, and we are going to be talking about the new review format project. And so we're really going to be thinking about Cochrane reviews, past, present and future. My name is Ella Fleming. I'm editorial product lead within the um, um, Cochrane Central team, and I'm joined by Gert van Valken Hoof, uh, Head of IT Development and Infrastructure. And we're both co-leading the new review format project. We also have Toby Lasserson, um, Deputy Editor-in-Chief on the line, and he will be monitoring the Q&A. So let's begin by thinking about or talking about what we are trying to achieve. And this is what we're trying to achieve with the new review format project. So we really want to be able to streamline the development and publication of Cochrane reviews. We want to make it easier and more efficient and just generally overall streamlined. We also want to improve experience. And this is the experience of everyone involved in um, producing Cochrane reviews. So your authors, your editors, peer reviewers, copy editors, all the way to the, the users and the readers. And third, we want to be able to innovate. So this is really thinking about innovation in terms of how we share and how we use our content. And I want to begin at the begin beginning. Um, so this is Archie Cochrane, um, our Cochrane's namesake. And his work, um, which included this monograph that you can see on the, on the screen, inspired the creation of Cochrane. And the first area that Cochrane's founders completed a large number of systematic reviews was in pregnancy and childbirth. And from this very early point, they knew about the importance of making the evidence accessible to the people that needed to use it. And so there was a large number of systematic reviews that went into this work, and they produced a summary book that really helped midwives and others use that evidence and use that evidence in practice. And, six, and, and since Cochrane was founded, making evidence accessible and usable has been fundamental to what we do. And so since then, uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses have, have really become the cornerstone of healthcare decisions. And over the 30 years of its existence, Cochrane has really been setting trends and leading the field, and that's in multiple areas. So first up, we have community. So Cochrane brought together expert international communities together to produce content. We have expert methods groups from across um, the globe who pioneered methods development and best practice and launched um, our handbook of systematic reviews of interventions. Using these methods, Cochrane has really set field standards for conduct in systematic reviews, as well as standards in how to report protocols and full reviews. And then we're on content and Cochrane was really revolutionary in creating databases that pulled together different types of content. So for example, a database of systematic reviews and a database of trials. Cochrane also led the way in data curation. So things like um, PICO annotation um, and, and some of the other work. And as an early advocate for online only publications, Cochrane can push for far greater transparency than other publication formats. So we're thinking here about kind of print articles. Um, and it allowed Cochrane reviews to really demonstrate the rigor in the methods and in the reporting. And that rigor and that, you know, reporting, that transparent reporting was missing elsewhere in the field. Other innovations um, included the publication of protocols, we were one of the first to do that, um, the ability to version publications when, when they're updated, and things like using plain language summaries to increase the accessibility of our evidence. And finally, um, we've led the field um, in terms of the tools that have been produced. So we have the, the RevMan authoring tool, there's a citizen science, citizen science platform called Cochrane Crowd, um, there have been innovative ways to, to citation screen using crowdsourcing and machine learning. So that's our screen for me um, tool. And the Cochrane Register of Studies, which is a data management tool and data repository. 
And because of how Cochrane has led the field and really pushed the boundaries, it's now internationally recognised as a benchmark for high quality systematic reviews. And over those 30 years, we've published about 16,000 reviews and updates. And that equates to just under 9,000 systematic reviews in the Cochrane Library today. 71% of Cochrane reviews are cited in at least one guideline, making a real difference in health related policies globally. And throughout the library, there are reviews with over 100 citations, um, altmetric scores of over 1000 and articles with more than 100,000 um, accesses. So really showcasing the impact that the, the Co that Cochrane reviews have. Um, but there are some challenges um, that that we face and Cochrane, you know, one of the one of the main things here is that Cochrane has used the same production model um, since its inception in 1993, so nearly 30 years ago. And since then it's grown organically. So that's resulted in inconsistent and sometimes time consuming and cumbersome processes. Um, sometimes these have, you know, no overarching prioritization framework and that's led to some um, areas of poor author retention. And compounding this, our systems and tools can be complex and some can find them unwieldy. And that has had a negative impact on our ability to innovate. And during this growth, a major tension has, has developed. Um, Cochrane's online publications mean that we can publish details to you know, demonstrate this rigour, um, but that's resulted in a lot of detail. Um, and we now have some very lengthy reviews that are relatively, you know, well, that are inaccessible to you. So our longest review to date is now over 2000 pages long. And, and Cochrane reviews on average take years to complete. And this means that members of our community are struggling. This process can be frustrating, um, it can be difficult and it can be time consuming. And so for authors, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a long commitment in terms of the time. Um, sometimes they'll find that by publication, they're feeling relatively burnt out. And that can lead to an unwillingness to return as an author, either to update that review or to produce a new review. Editors, peer reviewers and copy editors could also find the um, process uh, difficult and frustrating. For example, there is repetition of content across multiple versions of a, a review and in multiple places within a single review. And this invites errors of reporting. And it's all too common and it distracts from more worthwhile critique on the interpretation and the review of the scientific, scientific merit. And then we have the readers and these really long reviews, this, you know, 2000 pages long review is really difficult to digest. And then that means that it's difficult to use the evidence um, it going forward. And we really want to improve things all around with uh, the new review format and we want to improve it for everybody. And so we need to rethink about how we produce and publish our reviews to improve the experience of all of our stakeholders. And as well as the challenges we've we've faced in Cochrane, the, the the stage that we uh, that we work on has also uh, has also evolved over those years. So there's increased competition in systematic review production. The number of reviews and meta analyses publish, published are increasing exponentially. And Cochrane is no longer the kind of sole player in this game. Reviews are completed by researchers globally. And they're, you know, they're as well as health technology agencies, by guide, guideline developers, and many more organizations. The open science movement also represents new, new approaches to scientific process that fosters collaboration um, and you know, collaborative ways of working and new ways of sharing content and data by using digital technologies. And Cochrane has always really been at the forefront of the open science movement. They've always advocated for, for you know, the open science principles um, and you know, really led the field in terms of things like consumer involvement and protocol publication. But some of them, you know, some of the next big players here that um, Cochrane will be looking at is how it moves to open access publications. 
And then there's also new ways of sharing and using content. So for example, guideline developers are now commissioning evidence synthesis, but they don't necessarily want or need that full article. Instead, data and evidence process profiles are much more useful to them than the fully written up review. And lots of different users want different, sorry, excuse me, want different tailored, um, want different tailored uh, outputs that meet their needs. And much of this use, utilizes new technologi technological developments around sharing and using data. And so when the future of evidence synthesis changes in Cochrane were approved by the governing board, um, so that was in February earlier this year, a research project was init initiated to inform um, what would be prioritized for the new review format project. And this was led by the University of Cologne and Cochrane Hematology. And it involved collect, uh, collecting themes um, in different discussions with relevant stakeholders and then validating these ideas with the possibility of, of adding you know, new ideas or, or additional input with surveys across uh, Cochrane stakeholders. And so of the authors, the editors and the Cochrane community, we had 399 respondents and their priorities were around better functionality in RevMan, a shorter, more flexible review format, sort of general simplification in terms of the processes, better guidance to authors and better explanation of results or findings so they're easier to understand. For the users and the readers of our content, we had 599 respondents. So overall, it was just under a thousand um, altogether. And the readers and the users, they highlighted their priorities as better functionality in RevMan, better explanation of results and findings so they're easier to understand, better search, search execution on the Cochrane Library, and transparency for different studies and authors. And now I'm handing over to Gert. All right, thank you, Ella. And hello, everyone. Uh, I now want to talk about uh, what we want to do going forward. Um, and what we really need to do is uh, assert our position as a leader uh, in evidence synthesis production. And in order to do that, we need to address these challenges and ensure Cochrane can continue to achieve its mission. So as part of the transformation Cochrane is going through, we are evolving the format of Cochrane reviews. The goal is to evolve the format to maintain quality and reduce inconsistencies between publish, published reviews while maximizing sustainability and cost effectiveness. So it's really fundamental uh, that we support Cochrane sustainability, um, including through easier digestion, um, more efficient quality assurance and simplified technology to reduce our long-term cost base. Um, we want to deliver an attractive and consistent and efficient author journey for review development, data management and publication. Um, we want to diversify Cochrane's offerings to reassert our place in a competitive market, including new review types, um, new types of evidence and improved reuse of data. And we want to do all that while maintaining Cochrane's integrity, quality, and credibility. Okay, so how does the new review format help position us as a leader? So there are really three uh, pillars to this. And first is a shorter format um, that streamlines development and processing of reviews. Um, users of our evidence are best served by a better summary. And it's not just a question of format, uh, but also um, it's also the enabling mechanism for uh, the innovation around process uh, that we have seen so much of in the last few years. Um, simpler presentation makes maintaining reviews more straightforward um, because you're not going to be tied to revisiting the same text in multiple places. Um, and then moving on to the second pillar, which is improved data management. Um, transparency and interoperability. And what we mean by interoperability is really um, the ability to easily uh, move data between systems, between tools, um, and work with it where you need it. Um, so 
a refreshed format that is lighter on structure in the text um, means that we push structure to where it's needed most, and that's uh, in the data. So we're creating a, a standardized structure around the studies, their data, and associated syntheses um, to help us build products and systems that fulfill Archie Cochrane's original ambition of connecting patients and healthcare practitioners with evidence. So then uh, finally, the third pillar uh, are new ways of sharing our data and content. So in the future, we'll develop, uh, we'll develop new ways of sharing data and content via the Cochrane Library and via RevMan, uh, building on the work that's already been done and is still being developed on data management, PICO annotation, and study curation. So uh, these three pillars are really intended to all work together um, to deliver the maximum benefit for the effort that we all put in. Okay, so um, some examples um, of how this could work in future. So, um, like I said, we'll have more structured data and we'll have, um, uh, that will enable better data flows within our tools um, that really uh, help us um, build out functionality like prospective meta-analysis um, and to embed automation and semi-automation in more places uh, in our processes and tools. Um, so really looking at things like evidence surveillance um, and, and uh, moving further into the, the field of living evidence. Um, and so ultimately, this will lead to better linking um, of evidence and data through the evidence ecosystem. So for example, uh, through our partnerships with guideline development tools. Um, and what we think it will also enable is more tailored end products and more tailored dissemination uh, for specific audiences, um, as well as better visualizations of the data and evidence. Okay, so in 2023, we'll roll out uh, changes in the first two pillars, um, which are the, the shorter format uh, and improved data management. So um, on the shorter format in the review, um, the, <laughs> uh, like I said, the review will be shorter and it will be more focused on, on the main outcomes. Um, and one of the ways that we'll do that is uh, by separating out uh, some of the uh, peripheral content to supplementary materials, um, but also through uh, new reporting guidance and better templates. Um, and also moving to a more industry standard flat reference list. Um, so while um, we'll maintain um, the structure of, of studies and their associated references at the data level, uh, the reference list in the article will follow a more industry standard structure. Um, and then finally, um, we'll have a more structured um, summary table of characteristics of studies. Um, okay, so moving on uh, to the data. Um, we've already built a new data management structure uh, in Revman Web that's centered on data associated with each study. Uh, so this is a feature uh, that can be enabled uh, on request because it's currently being piloted. Um, so uh, using this functionality, you define the inclusion criteria for each analysis and RevMan will essentially do the rest. Uh, so this enables us to prospectively define analysis uh, at the protocol stage. And then connected to this, um, we have developed uh, an import uh, function that's compatible um, or that works with Excel compatible formats. Um, and uh, Confidence have developed uh, a compatible export function uh, that will be available soon. Um, then also we're working on data export from Rep and Web in the same formats um, and are working with Confidence on improved interoperability. Um, the most recent example of which is support for or better support for mean differences, odds ratios, and so on in their data extraction. So this data format and this import export functionality 
uh, will also be the basis for a standard data package uh, associated with each Cochrane review on the library. So what this does is really enable uh, a basic form of data reuse uh, in RevMan or, or any other tool um, as needed. Um, and then finally, uh, we're also, uh, we'll also be working on embedding controlled voc vocabularies in more places, um, both for the PICOs, but also for other study characteristics. Um, and this future development will further increase the potential for data reuse. Okay, so what will this mean for you in the community? So I think for authors, uh, Cochrane will be a more attractive publishing options, uh, option. Um, we'll have an improved experience, experience with decreased time uh, to produce a review and increased impact of the work. Uh, for editors, peer reviewers and copy editors, uh, again, will improve their experience and decrease the time it, completes, uh, it takes to complete their tasks. Um, and for readers and users, um, the uh, shorter, more focused articles uh, will improve readability and accessibility um, and make it and will make it more efficient um, to include data from Cochrane reviews and guidelines, among other things, through uh, the improved uh, export and data package functionality. And then also for Cochrane, uh, the work that we're doing will increase sustainability and improve cost effectiveness of producing reviews. All right, so a little bit on, on the timelines and what has happened so far. Uh, so as Ella said, uh, the governing board decision to move forward with the Future of Evidence Synthesis program as a whole uh, was taken in February of 2022, so this year. Um, and in July, um, the University of Cologne and Cochrane Hematology completed the research project that Ella talked about um, with close to a thousand responses from uh, our community and our readers. Um, and since then, we've been working um, with the, the central teams and Wiley uh, to really scope the implementation options. And right now, uh, we're going through a focused consultation process. Um, and that is with the editorial board, with the authors and editors of the handbook, uh, with our publishers, um, with teams across the central executive team, um, and many others. Um, and we're really considering on a case by case or feature by feature basis, uh, who is impacted and needs to be consulted. Um, and also, um, uh, starting soon, uh, we'll be uh, developing prototypes and doing user experience testing, um, creating examples, and then uh, developing and launching changes in stages. Uh, so really taking an iterative and agile approach in 2023 um, and we will be reassessing and realigning our priorities on a quarter by quarter basis. Uh, so more information to follow soon. Um, and uh, just to note as well that these changes will not affect the CRGs that are closing in April. Okay, so just to re reiterate uh, what we're trying to achieve. So we want to streamline the development and publication of Cochrane reviews. We want to improve the experience for authors, editors, and readers. Um, and we want to innovate in how we share and use our content. Um, so new review format really is the foundation of how we unleash the power of Cochrane content. Um, we're rethinking the evidence synthesis infrastructure to overcome the challenges in review production. Um, so the 2023 work um, is, is the foundation that will allow us to build exciting things in a way that we can afford. Um, we'll be consulting in 2023 for what, um, uh, for what that more exciting future uh, should look like and, and what we develop in 2024 and onwards. So Cochrane wants to produce even higher quality evidence syntheses for even better healthcare decision making. And that's our place for the next 30 years. Thanks, Gert. And just before we um, we move on to questions, I think it, the part that I really want to highlight is that with all the developments from across the field and the challenges that Cochrane face, we want to really make sure that our evidence is and always will be accessible and usable as that that's so fundamental um, to what Cochrane does. 
and it will allow Cochrane to keep pushing the boundaries in review development for the next 30 years. And I think it's worth mentioning that we can, you know, we can be smarter about how we produce the evidence. That's what we've been trying to showcase here today. Um, you know, we can retain the rigour that has historically been included in the written narrative detail of a review and, and think about how that could be maintained within data structures. Um, I think overall that will hopefully create a much happier and less burden burdensome separation of the write-up and the data and it will allow us to be have this kind of reassurance um, so it allows the reassurance for authors for editors peer reviewers and readers that fewer words does not equate to lower standards um, and you know this is really about making the whole process of Cochrane reviews more efficient um, you know we really want to be able to facilitate more you know quick development easier development quicker updates for living reviews so that that we can really um, monopolize on that living evidence ecosystem and it unlo unlocks the potential for different innovations and in how we tailor um, our evidence to, to key stakeholders. I'm going to move on to opening for questions and I can already see that there is uh, some activity in the chat box uh, so Toby. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody, for your comments and questions so far. Um, I don't know if going through them sequentially is going to be uh, possible. I'm, I'm going to pick out some, some, some themes which have emerged early. So this is a rapid qualitative uh, synthesis of what's come through so far. I might start, though, with a comment that Claire Jess posted first up, which was about um, that question about how simpler review, simplifying the review format uh, is possible when additional hoops uh, uh, the authors are having to navigate additional additional hoops, additional parts of the process. Ella, I mean the, the comment you made just towards the end of your of your um, of the presentation, I think helped to address some of that. But uh, do you have any further thoughts about this issue between format and process that it's worth responding to? Yeah, I think you know change is always um, is always difficult, and I think that the thing that's going to be really important as part of this change particularly for the process for authors will be the guidance that we develop and what we really want to do is to make it easier or as easy as possible for authors is to use better use templates um, so have specific guidance embedded within a review template that means the authors have the, the, the information they need when writing certain parts of their protocol um, and then their review. The data management um, changes that Gert was referring to within Revman also, um, also help authors kind of spend more energy and focus right at the beginning of the process of producing a review on defining the PICOs. Um, so defining the PICOs at the protocol stage with quite a lot of um, or probably more, more um, detail than, than we see currently. Um, and by using the guidance and how the tool kind of takes authors through that process we hope that that will help with the changes that we are going to be um, introducing. Thanks thanks um, Ella. Um, a couple of things I've picked out also are about timelines um, so when this is coming and the impact on reviews in process is it uh, is that something that you could address? Um... I think it's it's more I've been Ella that's uh, okay. in charge of the timeline. All right. Um, but I, I think yeah, what we um, the the first format change, like the detail of that, uh, we we want to announce that in February, um, and then it will really be um, become the new standard uh, from from August. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that we really want to break it down. So we want to um, we want to announce changes in in stages, um, and particularly for the first change that we want to announce, um, which will really be around supplementary materials. We're working with the um, with the platforms and the tools to understand the level of change that could be automated. So it puts very little burden on. Um, on authors um, to make specific changes within their reviews. Um, the idea in terms of the, the kind of implementation and how it will be introduced will be that 
we will um we'll will announce changes uh, we will launch um, prototypes and mock-ups so you can see what they look like we will launch the guidance um, and um, and you know a training training plan so that um, members of the community can be onboarded on the change and can understand the change and then at a later date and so at that point the, the change becomes optional so authors or you know can use the new format or they can use the old format and then after a certain period of time um there will be a kind of policy change that means all submissions going forward after that date will need to use the the new format but as i mentioned we're trying to do it in stages um so we're kind of working to the idea that there will be two announcements next year but again we're doing an agile approach. We want to take feedback on. We want to listen to the, the community um, as we as we as we introduce the community as we introduce the changes. Thanks. So the, the message the message to anyone who's sort of they've got a reviewing process and don't panic. Yes. They can still they can still go ahead with what yes. they with what they're doing. Yeah. There are a few questions I think related related to that. Um, okay, so um, uh, let's let's jump to the issue of data sharing. Uh, this might be one that, that you could you could take. So a few questions have come through about that. Um, so um, questions about um, Epi Reviewer and the integration there, but also I think with with Covidence as well. That was a question that came up um, later on. So how will that how will that work with those systems? Right. So, uh, so first of all, the the new um, the new way of of data management that we've built is really um, like one of its foundational principles is is that it it helps us align more closely uh, with the data extraction tools like Covidence and Epi Reviewer that essentially were already operating at a study level um, in terms of the data extraction functionality. So uh, that on its own. Uh, will make it easier to move data between Covidence, Epi Reviewer, other extraction tools, and RevMan. Um, then in addition to that, what we've really uh, done with, uh, with the data import functionality in RevMan is to create um, a very simple um, standard format um, to, to get the data into RevMan. And we've been working with Covidence um, specifically um, for them to build in support for our new formats um, and to also build guidance for how people can transfer their data well. Um, but essentially, because we're going uh, with um, a, a very kind of, we're going with very industry standard or very broadly supported formats, uh, this means that if, as long as you can export your data out of your data extraction tool of choice, um, you can work in Excel or other tools to reshape the data and make it ready to import into RevMan. So that should really, um, when you have a larger data set, um, get around the problem of copy paste, essentially. Uh, we all love it, that the idea of that, uh, a more sort of seamless, seamless transfer between systems. Um, so all, I'm just going to um, keep, keep on, on a particular question about data sharing. So we've talked about integration into RevMan, but um, Yorian Lemons also asked about sharing data, if you like, um, within and between reviews. Is that something you could pick up? How, how would, might that work? Yeah, so again, uh, this is also something where uh, the import and export functionality, so this is essentially why we think it's important to have an export and not just an import. Um, so um, these same formats will be used to be able to export data from RevMan. Um, so it, yeah, they will be the format that will um, be the data um, the data set that's going to be published on the library going forward. Um, and because it's the same format that we import, it makes it actually really easy um, for someone to go to the library um, and get their data into RevMan if they want, but also into other tools if that's what they prefer. Um, and so I think this is initially also um, the way that we can share data between reviews. Um, uh, yeah, al although I think we may... Um, we may want to think uh, about um, even better ways to do that uh, in the future. Yeah. Um, now, I guess I'm going to ask, it, I think it was a clarification that Andrew is um, uh, posted about, about the meaning of a flat reference list. I think you, you referred to it. Uh, do you want to just explain a bit more about that, how that might work in the new format? 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, one of the ways that, that um, Cochrane reviews are, are, let's say, technologically unique uh, is that we have this reference list that's essentially um, not actually one reference list, but um, maybe five or a hundred. Um, so what we essentially what we do in reviews is we have these separate sections of references to the included studies, which then contains a reference list for each study. Um, and this has really um, been, been a driver of, um, uh, of issues and costs uh, in our production pipeline, uh, because this is not how, um, how scientific articles are published in general. Um, so this is a very unique thing that's kind of holding back uh, efficiency gains kind of across our, our production pipeline. Um, and I don't know, Ella, if you want to to say anything anything else in addition. Yeah, I guess the I guess the the kind of the the, the overall aim with a, the flat reference list is that we lose those subheadings and we just have one reference list, one flat reference list. Um, that doesn't mean that um, the kind of studification of references, so references associated with a certain study, will be lost. Um, we're looking at ways that that might be shown on the published review. Um, it's worth mentioning that we'll be, you know, the, the way that we want to introduce changes that is that we'll start with probably like a, a minimum version of, of, of them and then build on the kind of user experience as we go forward to make sure that the, you know, what we build is, is fit for purpose. Um, but it's really worth noting that that the kind of studification of references will be maintained in Revman and will be maintained in other Cochrane systems. It will not be lost. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so let's think. Um, we focused, I think, or the, the fairly explicit um, uh, assumptions around intervention reviews, but we've had a question about how this might work or transfer to diagnostic test accuracy reviews. So are there plans in the pipeline for, I guess, not just ETA reviews, but think, thinking about other review types that we currently publish? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the first kind of phase, I guess, the first initial phase will be um, thinking about um, uh, intervention reviews. But what we want to do is reach out to the experts in the uh, methods of the other reviews, so DTA, prognosis, qualitative, to understand whether what we're proposing would have a negative impact on how other review types are managed. Because ideally, we want this format to or you know a format that works in a similar way to be used on all the different types of reviews that Cochrane publishes um, so there are the uh, the methods groups and the methods experts will be will be reaching out to them um, when we have the first mock-ups of, of this um, to really you know understand from their perspective how this would translate to their types of reviews and whether there are any would be any blockers or any issues um, for the kind of next stages of, uh, of introducing the changes for those reviews. Great. Um, so Laura Mishra asked a couple of questions. Um, one is about how, how this um, format is going to help new authors who've not previously been part of Cochrane Reviews. I wonder if there's a, there's a sort of, um, a, Maybe even a blessing for new for new authors. They're not they're not familiar with the, the previous versions. What might what might you know what might the experience be like for them? Yeah, we're we're hoping that the experience would be um, much more simple, much more simply you know much more simplified. Um, the templates that I mentioned, the kind of protocol and review templates, um, we're really hoping will help guide new and you know and experienced. Uh, authors with Cochrane um, <clears throat> to understand, you know, what report, what gets reported where and what you need to think about in terms of your conduct at which stage. Um, we're trying to move to much like a much more industry standard kind of review format in kind of the basic review, um, which would, you know, which will help if someone has authored a, a review for another journal and help them kind of translate those skills, be less kind of, I guess, daunting. Um, and then with the data management side, we want to make sure that we have the, the guidance um, and, you know, tutorials and how to um, how to take the methods uh, 
the methods theory um, and how that you know relates to what you do in Revman, for example, or in other tools that an author would use. Um, is there anything I've missed there? Um, I think what I would just add is I think uh, particularly the, the changes with uh, supplementary materials and the references um, will actually make it easier for new authors to understand how what they're doing in Revman will relate to what's going to be in the published article. Um, because yeah, really, we've, we're so used to how RefMan works um, and, and, um, and how Cochrane reviews look. Um, but kind of through this process, I've really realized um, how, how unintuitive some of it might be uh, if, if you're coming to it fresh, um, like really, oh, I'm doing this in RefMan and then what? <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, it will, it's also an opportunity for us to look at that user experience and make sure that that's crystal clear. Yeah, um, and Laura also asked about, um, I think, Ella, you, you, you mentioned sort of training or sort of rollout, um, and in, in particular about a, a virtual Cochrane workshop. So I guess the move to online, online training, um, will there be a new training module for this format? Yeah, we're working, we're going to be working closely with the training team to um, update the current training materials and think about how we can deliver um, kind of fit for purpose training um, for the, the new format um, throughout 2023 and beyond. Um, so this work um, will be starting in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. um, now, Claire just asked about, I'm interested about the survey um, mm -hmm. and noted that the number of responses uh, being low relative to the Cochrane membership. Do you want to just say a bit about how you went about um, launching the survey and where it was where it was hosted? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, yes, yeah, so we had just under a thousand responses to the survey, and we 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 shared it in two ways. Um, we shared it via the um, Cochrane Library and through the Wiley um, teams. So really targeting users and readers of the Cochrane evidence. Um, and then we created a, um, a, a very similar comparable version of that survey for the Cochrane community. So this was tailored for authors, for editors and for the, you know, the wider stakeholders across the community as well. Um, that one was shared um, through uh, email, the community one was shared through email campaigns, through newsletters, digests, um, through social media and Slack. Um, and any way that we, um, you know, through cascading through different groups in any way that we could, um, we could think of really, because we wanted to make sure that people who wanted to have a say had the opportunity to have a say. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah, that's the kind of the main routes that we shared that through. Yeah. And Toby, could I just add that that's actually a thousand responses to a survey is pretty much in Cochrane as good as it gets. Um, that's a that's a that's a high response number. We wouldn't expect to be able to reach and hear from our entire kind of membership base, which is in the tens of thousands. So I think it is it is um, it's important to remember that we 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 rarely get over a thousand um, for anything for any any time we go to the community to ask a question. So that's actually a very good response. Thanks for clarifying that. That Ruth. Um, I think when I when I filled it out, it certainly felt like a very particularly meaningful heavy survey. So you, you may even have had starters who didn't who didn't complete. But yeah, a thousand completed responses is, is as Ruth said, is actually pretty good going for us. Um, all right. So C Marcus has asked a question about evaluation, always a, an important consideration when contemplating changes like this. Um, so what might the evaluation process look like uh, to check if the if it's working, if we've got you know if it's if it's going well. Yeah, so um, as Gert mentioned, we, we want to introduce the changes in a kind of agile and iterative um, way. Um, so the idea is that we'll be launching changes um, periodically um, and each quarter we'll be looking at the, what we've done, how that, you know, how that's being used, the feedback from people that need to, to make the changes um, that we're introducing and think about, you know, you know, really basically taking the time each quarter or after each big change or each big announcement to really reflect, think about lessons learned and how we might improve things going forward. So change, this this change has to happen. We won't be um, piloting. 
it's more about introducing changes starting with like mi minimal versions of the change um reflecting on what worked and what didn't and what we need to change and then building on the um i guess the functionality um and 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 making changes as as were needed um now i'm going to jump to uh the question a couple of comments came in from um people i mean essentially quite quite i guess quite excited about this and um uh noting the degree of ambition but also i think um i guess uh, encouraging as miranda said encouraging people to think about how um how this might work with things like um uh, synthesis without meta-analysis uh which is obviously a, a, a sort of an ongoing methodological project in in Cochrane as well so I, I think there's some there's some sort of um uh, in, interest and excitement about uh, certainly about that um Sue Marcus has also asked about um uh, who will provide all the support without CRGs going forward I mean that that could be broader we could you know tackle that in, a, in the broadest sense but I think if we think specifically about about this how might roll out an ongoing support be provided for this yeah so I think one of the key things um, is the guidance that we develop. Um, we want that to be um, as useful as possible to authors, but that does not take away from the fact that authors will also need support. Um, there's also the fact that editors will need support and support will need to be, um, you know, support teams will need to be, um, you know, onboarded and trained about the, tr about the changes too. So we're looking at developing um, a kind of onboarding, I guess, like program um, that will have kind of tailored training for support teams, for editors and for authors. Um, we'll be working closely with Cochrane's community support team um, and other kind of Cochrane groups um, that might um, also be supporting authors. Um, I think this is an area for uh, more development. Um, you know, we've got to I guess, work within the resources that are available. Um, but I think, you know, I, I see this as a as a living, a living project. Um, we're gonna learn as we go um, and 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 address, you know, concerns. Um, we'll obviously try and um think about what 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 issues may arise, but also learning from any issues that arise during the process too, um, because we do want to make sure that authors are supported. Um, in the best way that we are able to provide the support. So working with anyone and, you know, everyone that is able to, to, to do that. Yeah. I, I don't think, know, Toby, if you've got anything to add given other well, changes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, when, when I you know, look at the slide, but also my familiarity with, with the project more generally, I think I felt that the biggest, the biggest shift is really around um, it's, it's in it's in two areas. I think it's it's um, the approach to data management being more standardised, um, and what that enables. And the other thing is is writing less, knowing how to write less. I mean, one of the it's you know one of the the, the challenges I know that my team often see is the tendency for people to you know the easiest way to write a copy and is to write everything is it's all there right and and actually, when you talk about shorter reviews or you talk about fewer words, actually, the, the most important behaviour you're trying to influence is um, sort of discipline around scope and focus. Because actually, that's you're, if you're summarising well, you're often, you're often making decisions about what information you have to leave out, be that in a plain language summary, be that in an abstract uh you know be that in a in a results section where you want to you want to try and get across as as much as you can without overwhelming either yourselves as authors editors referees copy editors and ultimately readers and users of the evidence in the review um and i think i think you know cochrane as an organization is going to have to learn how to how to sort of if you like summarize better through words but also structure better through data um, that was always historically, I think, a reasonable expectation of the process, but um, people approach it in such in such varied and different ways um, when it comes down to it. And 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 the whole point about about you know what we do is if you apply structure to data in a way that's standardised, 
you're making life easier for everybody who's, who's interested in that particular review, not least you as an author, not least you as an editor, not least you, you know, whatever your role is um, in that in that whole system. I think I think in putting structure into the data rather than into the text, you know, you know, it's about connecting us with that original, with that, you know, connecting users with data. That's such a big part of what we of what we do, and doing it through this way, I think. Is um, is achieving a, um, a a real goal around around um, making sure that data you know becomes evident becomes knowledge. It's a it's a, a more straightforward journey. But there are obviously there are implementation challenges. There will be with, with um, anything like this. Um, okay, so are there are a few there are a few other uh, comments. I think that there's one question. Claire Jess has asked one last question um, about retain author retention. Um, I think you cited it as initial as initial concern um, in, the, in the presentation. So how might this this change help to retain authors and prevent them from publishing elsewhere? Yeah, um, so we're we're really hoping we're aiming that this will really simplify the process for an author, um, and that they that that will you know if if it's a simpler less time consuming, less frustrating process that they are going to be more willing to, to come back and either update that review or write a new review. Um, author experiences and, you know, an author satisfaction is so important. Um, you know, it's one of the key pillars that that this, um, that these changes are trying to address. And someone's just posted something about data reuse, which I'll have to come and get my head around whilst I leave you, Gert, define what flat reference really means in the context of this project. Okay, um, so when we talk about a flat reference list, that's really um, for the article as it will appear on the library. Um, so let's get that out of the way first. Um, so in uh, RevMan, uh, we will retain um, th the structure that we currently have where um, references, like multiple references can be associated with each study, included studies, excluded studies, and so on. Um, so that will remain, um, but for the published article, we're moving to a single um, flat reference list, which just means that they are listed in order as they appear in the, in the review rather than um, structured by study. Um, and what that, why we're doing that is really um, the complexity of how we do references and the uniqueness of how we do references in Cochrane Reviews currently. Um, it's really holding us back from adopting uh, industry standard tools uh, that are used in production and um, of uh, and publishing, um, so that's been a, a somewhat of a cost driver for us. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, that that covered quite a few of the early comments and questions that came in. But I'm now going to jump to a question from Marta Roque Figgles, um, who's really I think interested in in what we mean by by a shorter review. So um, is it just you know word count? Or the main text will contain less material, and the rest will go to supplement. They mention materials. Um, so, in other words, is it is it the file itself that's remaining the same size, or is are we looking to actually make changes um, there as well? How does that break down? Yes, I, I'm happy to take this one. Um, I think there's there's two areas of it. Um, first is the separation of uh, supplementary materials, which will make the you know the physical file. Of the main review much shorter. Um, from the tests we've done so far, it's halved the 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 the, the file size. Um, the other aspect is an actual kind of more focused review, a review that focuses on the main um, objective, the main outcomes, and the main conclusions. And the way that we want to um, to address this is with better guidance for authors. And um, we're really thinking about how we can best utilize templates that are embedded within Revman. So when a new author kind of opens up a new review, they have exactly what they need to include in certain sections um, to really kind of target the reporting to what's needed in each section. We want to remove the, the duplication, um, you know, if, if, if the same information is duplicated in multiple areas of a review. Again, trying to tailor focus and, and you know, reduce, make the reporting more sort of succinct and concise and that as well will shorten the review. Thanks, Ella. So I'm going to 
try and be ambitious and combine uh, sort of questions that have come in on a similar theme around um, new reviews and also the flip side, which is updates. So, so Vittorio Lucci has asked um, about, or, or, or has made the explicit assumption that it applies to new reviews only, which I think I think we'd all agree is, um, is, is true. Um, Tess Moore wants to know about existing reviews, um, particularly when it comes to updates. So I don't know if you will go could address that one. I'm happy. Gert, do you want me to take that or? Sure, you start. Yeah. So we're trying to, so the way that we are um, anticipating introducing the changes is that we will um, announce the change is coming. So we will announce what the change is um, with mock-ups and prototypes of what that change will mean for a review. And at that point, we will launch a kind of comms and onboarding plan for training for authors. After a certain time period, so at that point as well, it's worth mentioning that the new format will become optional for authors to use or switch to. After a certain time period, um, we, you know, once we've kind of delivered the on onboarding and the training plan, we will be changing Cochrane policy so that all reviews submitted, so that's reviews and updates, will use the new format. Um, we've, we're going to have this kind of grace period because that will allow any authors who want to finish their review and get it submitted before that change can do, and then they ha don't have to make any changes. Or if an author is keen to make those changes, they can, they can use them because it will be optional. And then after that certain date, it will it will change for all all reviews and all updates. Um, this is an area we are still um, working through. We, we we this is um this is the the current kind of plan, um, and we are going to be discussing it with different teams um, as part of that fo focus consultation that Gert mentioned. We're also trying to think about how um, automated updates in the Revman will best support the changes so that the burden on authors is as you know as small as possible. Go ahead, anything to add on that? Um, no, I think you've covered it all actually. Okay. Thanks, Ella. You you mentioned, I think you mentioned um templates and providing some support. Is there any other any other further observations about specifically training? Uh, and that's the second part of Victoria's question. Yeah, so we um we at the moment we're developing the kind of mock-ups and the prototypes and we're going to be taking that um, to the training team in the, the, the coming months to think about how you know what what what's needed from a training plan to make sure that um, authors have the onboarding process that they need to be able to use the new format but also thinking about what editors need and what what the groups that support editors and authors need and thinking about how we could tailor that kind of onboarding plan for each of those different groups. Great, thanks, Stella. So uh, Eugenia Johnson's asked a really, a really good question. Um, it, it's partly to do with the diversity of research questions, review questions that we expect Cochrane to be publishing. Well, we've got a lot of them we publish now, but we'll be looking to continue to publish into the future. But um, also how uh, a specific Typically, how will the new review format be adapted to cover other evident types of evidence uh, synthesis formats that we're looking to publish, particularly where methods differ quite substantially to systematic reviews and and um, and Eugene co uh, covered um, things like scoping reviews, mapping reviews, prognostic prognostic and DTA reviews. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, the idea is that this this new review format will be as consistent as possible across all of the different types of reviews that Cochrane will. Um, be publishing. Um, Gert mentioned that we are um, that we're using a kind of agile and iterative approach to this project. Like changes need to happen, um, so we won't be piloting any changes. But what we will be doing is every quarter we'll be reflecting on what we've done, what we've done, and learning from um, you know learning from from what we what, what what reflecting and learning from what we've done as well. Um, the first kind of the first. Uh, changes will be with intervention reviews um, but as part of the focus consultation we want to be taking our plans to the different experts for the different types of reviews so prognosis, DTA etc 
um, to ask them, you know, if that something similar was implemented for your, the, your types of reviews. Do you um, envision any implications or any challenges um, so that we could try and make the, it consistent as possible across the different review types? And then those, those changes for those review types will be at the kind of later phases um, in, in, in the project. Thanks, Ella. Uh, I'm going to uh, throw in a question back to you on, on data reuse. So uh, Xu Jing uh, Sei Xie, um, has asked about um, what it really refers to. So is it just is it just about extracted outcome data or are we thinking about study characteristics and risk of bias assessments? Um, yeah, I, th I think um, ultimately we're talking about all of it, I would say. Um, and so uh, the, the data package that we're working on um, will include uh, both the, like the analysis view of the data, uh, but also the kind of the study view of the data. So the extracted outcome data, as well as the risk of bias assessments. Um, and currently a view of the um, of the study characteristics and what we really um, I think we have to admit study characteristics in, in Cochrane reviews right now are not very reusable. Um, so uh, one of the things in, in the kind of the future that we really want to look at is introducing more structure and more controlled vocabulary into that area specifically. Um, did I answer the whole question there, Toby? Uh, sorry, what was that? Did I answer the whole question there, Toby? Uh uh, yes, no, absolutely, mate. No, that was, okay. that, was, that was solid. Thank you very much. Um, a question about timelines. When can we expect the changes to start? So we, um, we're we aiming to announce the, the first changes um, in the first quarter of next year. And as we mentioned, that it will be an announcement to begin with, and that will become optional. And then after a certain period of time, policy changes and the next announcement will happen. So we're going to be um, starting with supplementary materials. Um, that's because it's an area that we can try and automate the updates within the system as much as possible so that the, uh, the impact on authors is as, as small as possible. Um, and by separating out these areas of the review, it really helps build the foundation for the other developments that we want to um, to, to, to prioritize, prioritize afterwards. Go, anything to add on that? Um, I, I think maybe uh, perhaps just that uh, with, the, with the supplementary materials, we'll also be looking at kind of the user experience in Revon Web and how we can make it more, more intuitively clear um, how what you're doing in Revman will be reflected uh, in the published review. Uh, so Matteo Bruschettini has asked um, about what is going into supplementary materials. And there's a policy question about copy editing, which I don't, I don't necessarily think we should, uh, we should address in this session. But certainly, what content could people expect to see in supplementary materials would be certainly relevant for you, Bella or Gert. Yeah. So this will include things like what's currently in the appendices. So we'll lose the appendices and instead have um, a specific supplementary material for search strategy um, and, and, and other, um, other supplements that authors want to add. We're talking about moving the, the full characteristics of included studies tables into supplementary materials, as well as excluded studies tables awaiting classification and ongoing studies. Um, other information that would be a supplement would be or supplementary material would be um, the risk of bias to uh, support for judgments and a full data and analyses pack that um, that, 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 that um, reflects the, the full the full data and analyses that the review has completed and what we'll be saying is that you'll have that full data set in supplementary materials but authors should be adding uh, specific um, forest plots and figures and tables to the main article that really reflect the, um, the review's objectives um, and conclusions. And then there'll also be the download data. So the, the full data package will also be downloadable through the supplementary materials. That's great. Thank you, Ella. It's nice to get that uh, clarification and a reminder about the importance of using of using sort of key supporting bits of data and information in the, the main review and sort of not having a complete partition between 
between the results and uh, the summary that we're publishing. Um, there have been some comments and questions about about the flat references, um, which I, I think we, we should return to. But before we do that, Rachel Kuban asked if we're working with, and Martin Burton has completely saved my um, my embarrassment by providing um, a definition of the FIHR, FHIR, sorry, uh, the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource. Um, so, and Rachel's asked if we're working with their standards on this. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that we're aware of, and I think has there have been conversations, kind of in the um, in the development of our PICO ontology and and the uptake of our PICO ontology, uh, as well as with our guidelines partners uh, on this area. Um, it's um, it's not entirely an area that I'm I'm comfortable with, uh, but kind of as we I think um get more into the detail of of the controlled vocabularies then we'll definitely be revisiting that thanks Gert. and just just coming back to flat referencing um so that some some of the comments have been um sort of questioning why we why we're pushing ahead with this uh sheila wallace has asked is it not a retrograde step shouldn't the rest of publishing be looking to catch up with cochrane um, and that the, the certification of references um, needs to be clear to the reader as well as to the review author, and that some people might struggle with that concept. So, Gert, you know, maybe returning to this, what's the what what's the value of that approach over what we currently do? Yeah. Okay. So, I I, I think the yeah, like I said earlier, the um, the reasons are really around standardizing um, and and. Um, and not being uh, in unique in, in ways that are unnecessary. Uh, but I, I do agree that the certification of references is actually very important in Cochrane reviews. Um, and so um, this will still be reflected in, in various ways. Um, so I think the, the summary uh, table of characteristics of studies is a very important uh, place for this, um, where it will be clear. Um, uh, kind of the, the references that go along with each study, uh, but also uh, I think the, um, the data set will contain this information as well. Um, so that's really, I think, also an important, um, an important way of still disseminating and, and providing this information. So maybe a way of thinking about this for my benefit as much as anybody else's uh, is to think of the sort of, you have a, a bibliography for a study which is still intact, but you're, but what you're sort of you're leaning on in the re, in the review itself, you're not going to necessarily need all that bibliography. You, you know, you're not looking to cite every study that you include, and let's be honest, every study that you exclude, right? Um, but it's it's a sort of the stuff that you that, that, that you lean on that you rely on the actual text that that's that's going to be in that sort of reference list. Is that correct? Um, yeah. So. I yeah, I think the, the, it'll still be clear from uh, from both the article and the data set that um, that kind of certification of references is, is there. Um, it just won't be um, it just won't be displayed that way in the reference list itself. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. I hope that addressed some of the, the sort of questions that people have been asking about about flat referencing and studified references uh, and letters to the editor. Um, okay, now uh, Mathieu has asked um, a question about whether the new format will also be used by Cochrane Evidence Synthesis and Methods, which I guess is, that's that's going to be the journal, isn't it, which we're, we're looking to launch shortly. I don't know, Ella or Gert, who um, between you might be most suitable to answer that one. Ella? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So. Um... The, 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 the new open access journal, Cochrane Evidence Synthesis and Methods, is, is completely separate to the Cochrane Library. Um, it's a separate journal. Um, and so this new format um, will be specific to the Cochrane Library. OK, so the notes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, but more information on the new journal will be coming out next week. OK, so we may even get a... We may even get a, um, a, 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 a a pointer as to what would be uh, what would be relevant uh, in, the, in the near future. Thanks anyway. Uh, so so oh. just, just to add, actually, so the, the new journal won't be considering full systematic reviews. They're, right. they're still in scope for the CDSR. Um, it's the, it's other evidence synthesis types that will be in the new journal, so more rapid reviews and scoping reviews, okay. um, and they will have sort of different criteria for consideration. Um, 
but again, yeah, lots lots more information on the new journal coming out next week. Okay, thanks. Uh, and Therese Dalsberg uh, has asked about um, uh, any research following the new development, especially if the content was more understandable for consumers. So, uh, you know, what sort of evaluation plans might we have in place um, to see what the impact of the change might be? Uh, do you want to take that one first? Or? Um, sure. Um, so, uh, like we said, we'll be rolling out changes in stages. Um, so um, evaluation will also happen in stages, but I think it's also important to stress um, the, the prototyping and, and the UX, uh, so user experience testing that will be happening ahead of time. Um, so before we really um, get into the nitty gritty technical implementation, we should already have a fairly good idea um, of what the impact is going to be. Anything to add, Ella? Uh, yeah, no, I think that that that's a really good point. And also, in terms of um, in terms of uh, evaluating some of the input, the the outputs and changes, I think um, it would be really interesting as well to kind of partner with people across the community that might be interested in doing kind of formal evaluations before and after studies, for example, um, about how the changes have impacted, um, you know, re uh, re use and accessibility of Cochrane evidence. We're very open to different ideas. Well, as we are, totally. Uh, and um, uh, Robert Wolf has um, uh, recommended Brian Alper to follow up with about the FIHR. Uh, uh, so thank you for that, Brian. So she, and Sheila's asked, uh, it, um, acknowledging the discussion about flat references earlier, about um, whether we might see mock-ups in advance. Hopefully not just not just in relation to that. I think other, there are other other features that would be nice to see in advance. Is there any are there any plans to do that? So we're going to have um, some. We'll have mockups um, and prototypes for when we announce the launch um, as part of the focus consultation that we're going through. Um, at the moment, we'll be doing some, some some user testing, as Gert mentioned, on what the proposals are before we kind of build the functionality. Um, so kind of user testing on mock-ups, I guess. Um, these are particularly being led by um, Wiley. Um, I think, you know, if, if anyone wants to get in touch, uh, my email's here, Gert's email's here. Um, if you're interested in, um, you know, um, volunteering some time, please do let us know. Um, it's also, you know, we, we want to take this iterative approach because we need, we need to launch, we need to make changes. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna launch in stages. So it might be that something that we launch first is maybe quite a minimal version, but it doesn't mean that we can't build on it as we go forward as part of a future update. So if there is something that, you know, people um, have feedback on as, as part of one of the first few um, first few changes, it doesn't necessarily mean that's where we'll be at the end of the process because we can always build on it. Because particularly around the studies and the references, that studification of references will still be in RevMan, it will still be in our tools, we're not losing it. Um, it's just about how we display it on the, on the published article. Um, and um, uh, Jane Dennis has asked about the involvement of, of uh, she says, seasoned review authors, so people with, with experience, I guess, of, of doing reviews and sort of doing reviews for Cochrane and, and using uh, the current setup. Um, how involved might they be in the development of the new format? Um, so we've, um, so the first, the, the, the research was completed by um, the Cochrane Hematology team um, and they, um, they, they surveyed and interviewed uh, a variety of different stakeholders that included authors. Um, going forward, we've been in contact, um, we've been consulting with the um, editorial board and, and, and handbook editors and authors. As we start developing these mock-ups, we also want to work with, um, with, with, with different members of the community to create those. Um, I guess, you, you know, there's, there, there is, there is there is definitely scope for um for authors uh, to be involved i think we're trying to take you know for, particularly for the templates and the guidance we're taking what's currently available um and building on on, on what we have um but as i said you know this is a this is going to be an iterative process so we want to hear from authors we want to hear from the community um to help develop and tailor and hone the plans as we go forward 
Does that, to what extent might that address the concern that Mar- Mary Elena, uh, echoed by Jane Dennis actually as well, has just um, uh, articulated? It's around uh, the lack of a pilot for the new format. Um, so you, it seems like there's, there's iterations. So what you've outlined is sort of an, an iterative process. But Mary Lane has essentially said, look, there's no pilot here and, and our own guidance uh, recommends this. So is there a reason for that? Um, yeah, and um, well, we the thing is, we know that the change needs to happen. Um, the governing board decision was that we need a new format. Um, there's a lot of pressure on um, Cochrane processes. There's a lot of pressure on authors. Um, there's a lot of change happening at the moment, and the way that we are developing the guidance and also developing the tools, so Revman to support authors, um, you know. There was, all of those developments are focused on supporting authors to make things a bit more intuitive and a bit a bit easier for for a new author or even an experienced author to be able to produce a Cochrane review. Um, yeah, we we need to make the change, so we will be launching changes, and we will be building on those changes. Um, we'll, we'll start, you know, with something you know, with with a minimal product and build on that as we go forward um change has to happen so we're not going to be doing a pilot instead as we mentioned we're going to be doing this agile approach where we reflect on what we've done and adapt each kind of quarter half a year um because the change needs to happen sooner than a pilot would allow and you've got um uh, support from Martin Burton in that in that view as well, Ella. He's just uh, he's just um, given uh, yeah, given his agreement to that that idea. Okay, all right. So I think um, oh, just as I was about to hand back to you, Ella, um, Elizabeth has asked about um, making Revman Web easy for authors to edit their own work in. Um, there's a, I guess there's a, there's a point in there about, about ultimately about submission quality if we've got authors editing their own work, because uh, it makes life difficult uh, for them to submit to the best standard where they can. Um, I get, I mean, I, that's, that's, that's quite a broad, that's quite a broad, but um, a well, well, well made plea. Is there anything to say in response to that? Um, yep, yeah, I'd say I'd absolutely agree. Um, and, uh, we're continuously working on making Revan Web a better tool, um, and I think, um, uh, like I talked about the the um, new data management and data import export features, I think will make uh, will make life considerably easier for authors, uh, particularly in the long term, uh, in in terms of supporting updates and so on, um, and will help reduce. Uh, both duplication of effort and duplication of data in the review. Uh, so I think that's one important aspect. Uh, but like I, I also alluded to earlier, I also think um, that with the uh, initial changes around supplementary materials, we also have lots of opportunities um, for making it clearer to authors uh, what will go into the published article. Mm. Um, I also, yeah, yeah I, beyond that, of course, we will continue to iterate. I, uh, I think one thing that's worth maybe coming back to um just to close off uh close off the comments and, and and questions that have come in certainly just from my perspective i think um one of the most important bits of guidance that we can prepare alongside this is not so much you know um the technical guidance but actually guidance about writing up and what um that skill about summary um and the importance of of you know, selecting information that you summarise and, and making sensible judgments about that so you don't burden yourself as an author um, or um, or anyone else who reads your review subsequently, not least users. Uh, so I, th- I think I've, I've gone through my qualitative evidence synthesis of all the, uh, all the comments and questions that have been, been posted. I'm sorry if you, if, if you feel that, that your question wasn't directly um uh wasn't directly addressed um but i uh as as i mentioned you summarize uh, and you often select stuff out as well as selecting stuff in now uh that, well maybe one last comment to round it off from Anne Rich is uh who has, has has noted and i think we'd all 
we'd all agree with this um to retain a degree of enthusiasm we need a face-to-face -face meeting and not something that's just online uh thank you gert for the reply that you've just posted about that um and uh do look at the colloquium website for 2023 which will be a face-to-face -face meeting and zoom will not be allowed i think in that in that term those three days I think as well, Toby, just to add that if anyone does have any more questions or, they, you know, a question comes up in the next couple of days or weeks, we've got our emails here on the slide. So please do reach out. We're very happy to answer any questions, any other questions that you have. Thank you very much to everybody who's posted on the, uh, on the chat. Over to you, Ruth. Thanks, Toby. So just um, thanks to everybody for joining us today. And I just wanted to remind people that... Um, there's information about the webinar series, um, which has been running uh, since uh, about April this year and will continue into 2023. So um, the future of evidence synthesis is on the Cochrane community page. Uh, it's, it's a page on Cochrane community site. And we have the last webinar for the year, which is on December the 8th. And that will be um, a review of 2022. So a look back over the year, what we've achieved, um, challenges that we have come up against. So we hope that as many of you will be able to join that as possible. And um, thank you for being with us today.